way. It contains a nearly total ban on abortions prior to viability, which the Supreme Court says violates women's rights under the Constitution. And perhaps most cruelly, it fails even to provide any exception for a woman's health and an exception for a woman's life that is so narrowly written and so convoluted that even a physician wanting to comply with the law in good faith would have trouble determining when the woman is sufficiently an extremist that it qualifies as, quote, life-endangering physical condition caused by or arising from the pregnancy itself, but not including psychological or emotional conditions, close quote, which we are told excludes the risk of suicide. How is a doctor to calculate the precise moment when, for example, a woman with Marfan syndrome is risking death by a dissection of the dis ascending the aorta, and, she, and as opposed to when we, she might only suffer deterioration in her condition that is not really life-threatening? What is a doctor to do when the woman's physical well-being hangs in the balance on one side and the five-year stint in prison on the other? Do we really want the care of women with crisis pregnancies to be conducted under those conditions? Is that really pro-life? I understand how personally important this is to some of my colleagues, and they're certainly entitled to their beliefs. But the many Americans who see the world very differently, including millions of women who value their personal autonomy, can be forgiven if this looks like just another battle in the Republican war on women, and if they value their right to make their decisions and not be subservient to the members of this committee. I accept that on this one we're going to have to agree to disagree. In this case, my colleagues appear through the operation of the criminal code to be trying to settle a scientific question on which there is real disagreement within the field. That is an excuse of raw political power, not of dispassionate fact-finding. The bill as introduced would prohibit nearly all abortions beginning at 20 weeks. That, as any first-year law student will tell you, is facially unconstitutional. Just recently, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit struck down a nearly identical Arizona statute saying, quote, since Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court case law concerning the constitutional protection accorded women with respect to the decision whether to undergo an abortion has been unalterably clear regarding one basic point. A woman has a constitutional right to choose to terminate her pregnancy before the fetus is viable. A prohibition on the exercise of that right is per se unconstitutional. Close quote. Nonetheless, this bill would prohibit nearly all abortions, including those involving threats to a woman's health, including those resulting from rape or incest, and where the woman may have become suicidal. Exceptions to protect a woman where her life and health are at risk are required throughout pregnancy, even post-viability, if the law is to be constitutional, but are not provided for in this bill. I hope that in addition to the many statements of concern we will hear today for fetuses, we may hear a few kind words for women and their families. The prison sentence in the bill has been more than doubled from two to five years. That should teach anyone not to disagree with members of Congress on questions of science. This legislation represents an extreme view of the abortion question and is at odds with the science. That is why people in many states have firmly rejected it, including the people I represent. Just as it is an outrage for Congress to impose its will on the people of the District of Columbia, in this case, so too, I will fight any such usurpation of the rights of my constituents. I am not going to sit here and debate the question of fetal pain, except to note that Dr. Anand, who was cited in the majority's witness testimony and a few minutes ago was cited by the chairman, told us, quote, I think the evidence for and against fetal pain is very uncertain at the present time. There is consensus in the medical and scientific research community that there is no possibility of pain perception in the first trimester. There is uncertainty in the second trimester, close quote. The Journal of the American Medical Association con concluded that, quote, evidence regarding the capacity for fetal pain is limited but indicates that fetal perception of pain is unlikely before the third trimester. Close quote. The Royal Academy of Obstetricians and Gynecologists concluded, quote, it can be concluded that the fetus cannot experience pain in any sense prior to 24 weeks gestation. Close quote. Are we really going to take sides in this scientific debate by jailing and bankrupting people who don't agree? Because that is what this bill will do. Similarly, the claim that an abortion is never necessary to protect a woman's health is simply not one that is widely held in the medical profession. And the idea that we should be enshrining these marginal views into the criminal code defies reason. I hope that my colleagues here today will at least agree that even if they don't want to approve an exception for rape or incest, a woman can, in fact, become pregnant as a result of rape. That seems to have been in some question in this House. I find it deeply disturbing that when it comes to issues like this, some people think there is nothing wrong with making families in crisis have the courage of legislators' convictions. 
That is just wrong. This bill is another in a long series of bills that says, in effect, we have to make the decisions regarding abortions for women. Women cannot be allowed to make this very personal decision for themselves because they are too immoral or too stupid to do so. Fortunately, the Constitution has more regard for women than this bill. We have heard a lot about the Gosnell case, and I would like to address it at the outset. Dr. Gosnell is a criminal. He is going to jail, and deservedly so. Colleagues who were here at the time may recall that I actively supported passage of the Born Alive Infants Protection Act, which made it a crime to kill an infant once it is born alive. As I said at the time, that was already legal, illegal everywhere. It was called murder. And even if the bill was duplicated, we supported it just to deny anyone the pretext of falsely implying that supporters of a right to choose somehow support infanticide. But of course, even though it is patently false, there are people who are perfectly comfortable making that false charge anyway. That bill was not about abortion because it involved live births and affirmatively killing a newborn. It was about classic murder. Similarly, Dr. Gosnell's practice of snipping a newborn's spine following a live birth was clearly murder and obviously illegal. That is why he was convicted. What the Gosnell case does not illustrate, no matter how many times activists insist it should, is anything regarding the practice of abortion generally. The fact that 40 years after Roe, it is hard to find another practitioner like Gosnell really speaks to the actual state of that practice. It is a tragedy for these women, and it is a disgrace that any medical practitioner should have acted in this manner and should have been allowed to do so for such a long period of time. I would urge my colleagues to think about the extent to which he represents the poor quality of health ser care services available in less wealthy communities. We should be working to provide high-quality health care to the uninsured to make sure that the full range of health care services, including family planning services, that are available to people with money are available to the poor and uninsured as well. If that means funding a Planned Parenthood clinic in every neighborhood to put guys like Gosnell out of business, so be it. If it means closer regulation of the medical profession, so be it. If it means const uh, an end to the constant efforts by my Republican colleagues to limit the rights of injured, insured, of injured patients to sue, so be it. But let's not pretend this is about the practice of abortion in America today. If it were, our prisons would be filled with Gosnells. I don't think any of my colleagues have stopped going to the dentist because one dentist in Oklahoma was found to have infected thousands of patients. And I don't think we should outlaw abortions because a bad actor committed crimes against his patients. If we started legislating on the basis of the bad actors in every medical specialty, then dentistry, podiatry, and every other field of medicine would have been outlawed long ago. I'd make, I would make just one final observation. We all took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I would urge my colleagues to reflect on that oath as we consider this legislation. While some may hope that the Supreme Court will ultimately move in a di different direction on these questions, the fact remains that 40 years after Roe v. Wade, even this far more conservative and hostile court has declined every opportunity to do so. The law is clear. This bill is unconstitutional. And we ought to be true to our oath and endeavor to pass legislation only that comports with the clear requirements of the Constitution. I urge my colleagues to reject this misguided, cruel, and unconstitutional legislation. And I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And uh, are there any amendments to H.R. 1797? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at uh, the, the desk. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. I have an amendment at the desk, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the subcommittee amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1797. Without Offer objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you. My amendment makes a simple revision in the uh, prohibition of uh, this bill so that pregnancies resulting from rape and incest are explicitly excluded from this constitutional ban. Uh, it would make the bill a little better. It, it doesn't change my opposition to the bill. Without question, rape and incest are crimes. Yet, H.R. 1797 absent my amendment would allow the victims of these crimes to be re-victimized by forcing them to bring these pregnancies to term. How could we allow 
such a travesty. Uh, the bill already endangers the health and well-being of women by criminalizing safe and legal abortions with a, only a limited uh, exception. I'm shocked that Congress would abrogate to itself the authority to dictate how a woman who has been brutally savaged by the crime of rape or incest uh, should deal with the consequence of such a crime. Admittedly, uh, my amendment makes a terribly flawed measure somewhat better, and uh, it would still represent an unconstitutional, the bill would still represent an unconstitutional infringement on a woman's right to choose. So I ask my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to do the right thing, to ensure that women victimized by rape or incest are not further victimized by this measure. I, accordingly, I urge support for the amendment and yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I must oppose the amendment. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, the tragedy of rape and incest uh, are almost difficult to articulate. Uh, it is an evil that beggars my ability to express. And I think all of us know that here. And I noticed that the rape incest exception that the gentleman has doesn't have anything about whether it should be reported or not, because all of the other um, in rape and incest exceptions do. They said it should be reported within 48 hours or so. And uh, yet the difference here is that these babies are going into the sixth month. And the, the notion that, uh, that, that we should wait till the sixth month to report rape or incest is, is a flawed one. I mean, if based on that, why would we have a logical argument not to extend that to six months after they were born? I don't think any of us would argue that a, a child should be uh, killed because of the sins of an evil, evil rapist. Uh, what we need to do is be harder on the rapist. I wonder how many of my colleagues on the other side would say that we should suggest a death penalty for the rapist, but they certainly do for the child. So, Mr. Chairman, this is uh, uh, the, the fundamental opposition here should be predicated on the notion that uh, this child is going into the sixth month of pregnancy as dated by most OBGYNs and, and abortionists and neonatologists. And um, to say that we wait until then uh, to, to say that there's a rape or incest involved is uh, waiting too long, and that's why I would have put it. Would the gentleman yield for question? Um, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to debate the substance of the amendment. The, the arguments on both sides are, I think, quite well known. But I notice you, you asked, uh, uh, you noted rather, that the amendment does not make any requirement that the rape be re or, the, or, or incest be reported. Uh, my question is, wh what difference does that make? What well, is the point, the, the point I was trying to make, uh, uh, Mr. Nadler, is that, uh, you know, before when my friends on the left side of the aisle here tried to make rape and incest the subject because, you, you, you know, the, 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 the uh, incidence of rape and, uh, resulting in pregnancy are very low. But when you, make that, uh, exception, when you make that exception, there's usually a requirement to report the rape within uh, 48 hours. And in this case, that's impossible because this is, six, this is in the sixth month of gestation. And that's what uh, completely negates uh, and vitiates the, the purpose for such an amendment. I thank the gentleman. Right. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Who seeks recognition? Mr. The uh, gentleman from New York, for what purpose do you seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 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 I'll be brief. I just want to observe that uh, um, um, the only reason in this uh, uh, context why a reporting requ uh, requirement uh, is relevant, um, and yes, you're right, if, 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 if you're talking about a rape that occurred four or five months ago, uh, she may not have reported it, but what's the difference? The only reason is if you're really implying that women would lie about a rape in order to get an abortion. Would the gentleman yield for a question? 
Sure. Do, do you not think it's easier to prosecute the rapist the sooner the rape is reported? I mean, oh, I'm I, I, reclaiming my time. I uh, certainly do, and I certainly hope that every rape is reported immediately. But, 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 as a, but you should know that not every woman reports rape. We should encourage them to do so, obviously. My point is that in, amend, that in, a, in a provision in a bill, rather, or an amendment, if we, that says that a pregnancy, that you can get an abortion under certain circumstances in pregnancy resulting from rape or incest, the reporting requirement there is a condition on, 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 on getting the abortion, and, and that doesn't encourage the reporting. Or that, uh, that is simply saying that we don't trust the woman uh, uh, to be truthful about it. In any event, uh, uh, I think that uh, someone clearly, I, again, I, I, I think this whole bill is a travesty, but someone clearly who is, whose pregnancy results from rape or incest should not be forced to carry uh, in effect, a hostile pregnancy to term. I yield. Would, would the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I would just like to uh, express my support for uh, Mr. Conyers' amendment. Obviously, even if the amendment is passed, the bill is uh, not worthy of support. I just find it astonishing to hear a phrase uh, repeated that the incidence of pregnancy from rape is low. That's not, I mean, there's no scientific basis for that. And the idea that the Republican men on this committee think they can tell the women of America that they have to carry, and to tell that young girl. And the reason I've done it, uh, uh, the comments of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle notwithstanding, is because I do know what happens when women are raped or become impregnate, impregnated because of incest, because I've prosecuted both kinds of cases, which is why I do support it, which, by the way, is outside outside my own party in some instances. And I was looking during this amendment, I, I was looking for reported within a week, re reported within a month, re reported within two months. And, and then I was wondering if any of our colleagues who did criminal defense work ever defended someone who was charged with rape. A and I wonder if they ever stood in front of a jury and argued that it was a false allegation. I wonder if that's ever happened. If any of my colleagues who've ever defended rape cases have ever stood in front of a jury and argued that it was a false accusation. Mr. Chairman, I prosecuted a case where a woman became pregnant as a result of rape. And she walked from the car in which she was raped, nude, to a guard shack. To report it. I can't imagine the humiliation, the terror, the grief, the humiliation if she became pregnant as a result of the rape. So I know what happens, and that's why I support the exception. But I looked in this bill, and I don't see reported within a week, within a month, within two months. Mr. Chairman, last night I was thinking about the other end of life. And I couldn't help but note that in this country's history, we have executed people by burning, by crushing, by hanging, by firing squad, by electrocution. And now we've moved to lethal injection. Mr. Chairman, do you know why we went from burning and crushing and hanging and firing squads to lethal injection? We did it because we were concerned that people who committed heinous acts might possibly feel some pain as that sentence was carried out. If it's good enough for people who have committed some of the most horrific acts in this country, surely to goodness can we not be concerned a little bit about pain from the most innocent members of society? Is that too much to ask? If we change the method of execution because we're worried about pain, can we not show a little bit of concern about the beginning of life, the most innocent members of humankind? And, and my final point is this, because I've heard it twice now, that because Roe versus Wade was decided, it's settled law. I mean, that ignores the fact that every time you appear in appellate court, you file notice that you want to argue against precedent. It also ignores this fact, Mr. Chairman, I was there, and you were too, when the President of the United States, in front of the Supreme Court, argued to their faces that they were wrong on a point of constitutional law. 
So the notion that we just have to accept the law because five justices happen to agree on something is legal balderdash. What? Nothing would ever be overturned if that were true. So we've by no means relinquished our right to argue against precedent just because five members or six members happen to have decided something. I listened to the President of the United States tell the Supreme Court to their face in the State of the Union, you got it wrong. So I don't think it's too much for Congress to tell the Supreme Court they got it wrong. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. I, I very much appreciate the gentleman's very eloquent remarks. I would only add that whether this amendment included a time frame for notifying the uh, authorities of the rape or incest, uh, that by the time a child reaches uh, the period of gestation where it can feel pain, uh, in the fifth or sixth month or beyond of pregnancy, I would no longer uh, support the exception under those circumstances, that uh, given that length of time, uh, there, w there would it seemed to be, be no justification, even if you reported it within uh, uh, 48 hours or a week, to wait until 20 weeks to uh, have the abortion performed would, would seem to me to be absolutely unacceptable. And, and that was my point. M my point is this has nothing to do about an exception for rape or incest. If that were the case, then they would have included within a week of the act taking place. Uh, this amendment has nothing to do with preserving that exception. This amendment is about trying May. responsibility to protect the lives of unborn children. Medical advances in recent decades allow doctors to help preborn babies in ways we never thought possible. Tragically, some ignore these scientific breakthroughs as well as common sense to justify the killing of the unborn. This is an issue that is very personal to me. When my wife Lisa was pregnant with our first child, we learned that our daughter Jordan was affected by spina bifida. We were shocked when people approached us after Jordan's diagnosis saying we had a choice on whether to keep our daughter or not. We knew that Jordan was a gift from God and there was a plan and purpose for her life. We believe that the fact more strongly than ever today and we cannot imagine life without our 21 year old who graduated high school and is a light to anyone she meets. I know my family is not alone. Many folks have welcomed children into the world in the midst of difficult circumstances, not because it was easy, but because it was right. The vast majority of folks in Georgia's Ninth District understand that life is a gift from God that should be protected, not snuffed out when deemed inconvenient or challenging. Last year, I was proud to be part of the effort in Georgia legislature to pass a similar bill to protect unborn pain-capable children, which was ultimately signed by Governor Nathan Deal. Georgia and other states have laws on the books specifically protecting pain-capable children, and other state legislatures are considering similar bills even in light of the challenges that have been made. In light of the recent trial of Kermit Gosnell, during which the atrocities of late-term abortion were on full display, there has never been a better time to extend the protections to pain-capable children in our nation's capital. I support this legislation because I believe preborn babies across the nation deserve the same protection as those in Georgia. And not only do I support this bill, but I also oppose this amendment for the simple fact that any time we deal here, and I'm very uh, appreciative of the gentleman from Arizona and the work that he has put into this and the comments that we've heard on both sides of the aisle because I, like the gentlelady from Texas, agree that this is a concern and you have to find what is balanced, but you also have to find in your heart where you believe life is worth protecting. And in this bill, for some of us who believe that abortion is something we would not like to see at all, this is a bill in which five months is allowing for abortion. In fact, it's allowing more time for abortion than it takes issue with abortion. When we think about that, there's multiple arrays and disagreements in this panel. For me, it's personal. For me, it's about those who've not had a voice yet, but one day may sit right here, and they may be like my daughter, and they'll roll in, because they weren't born maybe like you and I. And there was a choice, as someone told my wife, you don't have to go through with this. You have a choice. Every April 1st, I say happy birthday, Jordan, because you were the choice for life that we made. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks the gentleman. For purposes of the gentleman from Tennessee, seek recognition.
Well, kind of to speak against the <coughs> bill and, and kind of kind of ask a question. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kind of why? What are we doing? Uh, we've got differences of opinion on and have in this committee on when life begins and the four issues or four facts that that Mr. Frank put out about what those fetuses had in common. I think he, he forgot a fifth one, that they all have a mother. Uh, and that was one of the four. I must have zoned out after two. Uh, but the reason I zoned out is because the reality is this bill is going nowhere in the Senate. And there are children that came into this country with their parents, no fault of their own, innocent, who we could work on the DREAM Act that the Senate is going to pass an immigration bill, and we could be working on helping those children have a, an opportunity to be American citizens and contribute and go to college at reasonable prices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there are 20 children that died in Newtown who were innocent, and we could be working on background checks, and we could be working on high-capacity magazines and try to figure out some way to keep the children that are alive, and that is going somewhere in the Senate, I believe, and there's a chance. And yet we're doing this bill and talking about it, and, and all everything everybody says is fine and dandy. We've got differences of opinion. We know this bill is going to pass out of this committee, and it's going nowhere. But if you really want to help some innocent children and do something, we ought to be talking about how to stop children from being murdered. Are there further, are there further amendments? For purposes, the gentleman from New York seek recognition. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the subcommittee amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1797, offered by Mr. Nadler. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and the gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment, which I offered together with the gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Delbeni, simply provides what the Constitution requires a full exception to protect a woman's life and health. Let's be crystal clear about this. The Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade struck down certain pre-viability abortions. Now, I know Mr. Gowdy seems to think that we shouldn't take any guidance from the Supreme Court, but those of us who disagree will point out that the Court explained, with respect to the state's important and legitimate interest in potential life, the compelling point is that viability. This is so because the fetus then presumably has the capability of meaningful life outside the mother's womb. State regulation protective of fetal life after viability Thus, is both logical and biological justification. If the state is interested in protecting fetal life after viability, it may go so far, may go as far as to prescribe abortion during that period, except when it is necessary to preserve the life or health of the mother. Close quote. In the companion case of Doe v. Bolton, the court clarified that the state may not prohibit an abortion where the woman's life or health is at risk, and that this determination must be left to a woman in consultation with her doctor. The court further held that health includes both physical and emotional health. It observed, quote, the medical judgment may be exercised in the light of all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and the woman's age, relevant to the well-being of the patient. All these factors may relate to health. This allows the attending physician the room he needs to make his best medical judgment, and there is room that operates for the benefit, not the disadvantage, of the pregnant woman, close quote. Since Roe and Doe, the court has narrowed the constitutional protections available to women to protect their right to choose. In Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey, the court set out an undue burden test for determining whether abortion restrictions are permissible. As the court observed, quote, numerous forms of state regulation might have the incidental effect of increasing the cost or decreasing the availability of medical care, whether for abortion or for any other medical procedure. The fact that a law which serves a valid purpose one not designed to strike at the right itself, has the incidental effect of making it more difficult or more expensive to procure an abortion, cannot be enough to invalidate it. Only where state regulation imposes an undue burden on a woman's ability to make this decision does the power of the state reach into the heart of the liberty protected by the Due Process Clause." Close quote. So that's the law, whether some people like it or not. That's the constitutional command, whether some people like it or not. We have taken an oath to uphold the Constitution, and that is what it commands. It is also a matter of simple decency. Are we really prepared to say that the law will require a doctor to allow a woman's health to fail to avoid five years in jail? Are we really indifferent to the possibility that a woman might commit suicide, as this bill commands? I hope not. There are limits. 
And I think protecting a woman's life and health are the minimum we should be doing here. The Constitution demands it, and simple humanity commands it. I urge the adoption of the amendment. I yield to the gentleman from Michigan. Yes. Thank you very much. I support this uh, strongly and uh, ask unanimous consent to uh, add my statement to yours after uh, this discussion. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, Without objection. I yield to the gentlelady from uh, California. I, I would like to speak in uh, support of uh, the amendment, not only does the Constitution require this, but just common sense and humanity requires it. I uh, recall very uh, clearly the situation of uh, the daughter-in-law of uh, my colleague on the Board of Supervisors, Vicki Wilson, who at one time was a witness, and I will say a mistreated witness, in uh, this committee. She and uh, her husband, Bill, were very excited to be finally, after uh, two boys, uh, to be the parents of a daughter. In fact, they picked out a name. They were uh, thrilled and then were devastated to find uh, that the, the brain had completely formed outside of the cranium, that the uh, much wanted daughter would never survive, but further, that if the pregnancy continued, uh, be protecting and investing in programs that are needed to ensure that all women, regardless of income or background, can access affordable care that they need to have healthier pregnancies. Instead, H.R. 1797 is a direct challenge to the protection of women's health that the Supreme Court provided in Roe v. Wade. H.R. 1797 bans abortions necessary to protect a woman's health and fails to recognize that many things can go wrong during a pregnancy. A woman's health could be at risk in ways that doctors, not Congress, are in the best position to evaluate. And H.R. 1797 would force a woman and her doctor to wait until her condition was terminal to finally act to protect her health, but by then it may be too late. This restriction is not only unconscionable, it's unconstitutional. For four decades, the U.S. Supreme Court has recognized that Congress must make exceptions that permit abortion when necessary to protect a woman's health or life. In a um, so when we focus on legislation that comes between women and their doctors, we're allowing Congress, instead of doctors, to set medical protocol. We should all be concerned that women's health and medical safety needs are being ignored by this bill and le will leave doctors unable to provide their patients with the best quality of care. H.R. 1797 fails women and their families, and I urge my colleagues to support this amendment pr to protect women's health, and I yield back. Are there any others seeking recognition? The gentlelady from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I indicated, I'm, I'm feeling uh, a little bit of um, nostalgia or deja vu, uh, being reminded of some many, many um, days and weeks and, and years of this similar debate. I'm almost reminded of the time when Pat Schroeder was on this uh, committee. Uh, for those of you who wish to check your history book, she was one of the first women to serve on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, and I remember the weeks that we uh, engaged in this debate on what then was called the partial birth abortion, which in actuality was a medical procedure that was done to, as Mr. Nadler's uh, amendment, to impact uh, on the uh, health of the uh, woman as well as the life. And uh, I um, hope that maybe we would find common ground uh, in this effort. I would hope that it would not be characterized as gutting the bill. In fact, I, I'd like us not to talk in those terms. What we're trying to do, frankly, is a combination of interpreting what is constitutional law and the right to privacy, but then we're giving ourselves an immediate uh, if you will, a uh, medical degree. We're also uh, putting ourselves in the 
complete the heart, the mind, the body of a woman who has to make a very difficult and tragic decision. With that, uh, we will cast aside possibly an amendment that has value to it because it speaks to an exception on the life or health of the mother.